Welcome uh, to our Norwich Society Historians uh, Group meeting. We're very happy to welcome you. I understand that quite a few of you have um, uh, signed up for today and are watching, are, are not members of the society. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome you and hope that you might consider one day uh, joining us with, with a membership. And um, you can see about that uh, on the Norwich Society.org.uk. That's our, our website. I'll say a bit more about that at the at the end. So um, today we um, have the first of our talks for 2022. And we're very pleased to start um, with uh, Vanessa, Vanessa Trevelyan, who um, really casts a very long shadow for us in the in the Norwich Society. She's a past chair of the society and um, active in many uh, in many parts of it. But she's very active in particular uh, with the historians group. And you will see a number of her presentations already on our uh, Norwich Society YouTube channel. She was uh, formerly uh, the director of the Norfolk uh, Museum Service and um, Importantly for today, in her background, she was a founder member of, um, of Ketz Heights, uh, the Ketz Heights group, which um, uh, keeps alive this, um, uh, this, sto this amazing story, which she will talk about a bit about today. So, uh, Vanessa, very happy to have you talk to us, and let me pass the time over to you. Thank you. Um, when I, a few years back, when I heard that C.J. Sansom had visited Norwich to research his next Shard Lake book, I thought I really ought to read all the preceding ones so I'd be up to speed. And I was immediately captivated by the character of the protagonist and the level of historical detail. And I thought it would be fun to chart Shard Lake's progress through Norwich. And this presentation is the result. So I'll just share my screen. Right. Um, I think this is a first for the Norwich Society, taking a fictional character as the basis for a talk about a key period in Norwich's past. And there's still so much to see of Tudor Norwich, and I hope listeners will be encouraged both to explore Norwich and to, and to read the Shard Lake novels. So in 1549, England was in crisis. The new king, Edward VI, was still a child, and the country was governed by the Duke of Somerset as Lord Protector. Costly wars, rampant inflation, and the enclosure of common land led to a considerable hardship amongst the commoners. Landlords were converting common land into pasture for sheep, which had become more profitable as the price of wool rose. With the majority of the population depending on the land, this led to outbreaks of unrest across the country. Kett's rebellion in Norfolk, which lasted for six weeks in July and August, was the most serious of these. C.J. Santham has written a best-selling series of novels featuring Tudor lawyer Matthew Shardlake. And I, as I say, I discovered these, Norwich, these novels when I heard that C.J. Sansom had visited Ketz Heights as part of his research for Tombland. And I thought I had better catch up on the earlier books in preparation and immediately became a fan. Tombland is the seventh in the series and features Ketz Rebellion. In 1549, the fictional lawyer travels to Norwich to investigate a crime allegedly committed by a member of the Boleyn family. He is caught up in the rebellion and ends up a prisoner on Ketz Heights. This presentation takes us through the Norwich that Shardlake would have known and covers the key stages of the rebellion. If you know the books, the characters will be familiar to you. And if they're new to you, I hope you will be inspired to give the books a go. C.J. Sansom was impressed when he visited Norwich, and especially by the sweeping panoramic, panoramic view afforded from Ketz Heights, which explains why Robert Ketz selected it as his headquarters. C.J. said, you can stand at Ketz Heights on the steepest part of the escarpment next to the one surviving remnant of the chapel Ket used as his headquarters. And on a clear day, you've got a magnificent view. You feel that you can almost reach out and touch the cathedral spire. That was a real highlight for me. This first part of the presentation looks at some of the sites and buildings that Shard Lake would have frequented, and then we'll follow the course of Ketz Rebellion. Shard Lake travelled from his home in London and first entered Norwich through the Magdalen Gate, which formed part of Norwich's defences. The defensive walls were built of flint and rubble and were completed in the mid 14th century. They were the longest walls in Britain, longer even than London, 
and today only fragments remain, but the circuit is vis visible and largely followed by the inner ring road. You'll see from this um, interpretation that the walls don't go all the way around Norwich. Rather significantly, part of the defences are actually formed by the river, which, as it turned out, was not particularly defensive at all. The Magdalen Gate, where Shard Lake entered, was not the most fashionable entrance. It was one of the places where hangings took place. And here you can see an image of hangings at Tyburn, which is very much what it would have looked like outside the Magdalen Gate. The Norwich Society has produced a number of resources about the walls, which you can find on our website, a series of self-guided walks following the route of the walls, a publication and a short video. Shard Lake stays at the Maid's Head with Nicholas Overton when he arrives in Norwich. Subsequently, it was taken over as part of the Earl of Warwick's headquarters. The hotel was first mentioned in Norwich court records in 1287, when it was called the Myrtle Fish Tavern. Edward the Black Prince, eldest son of King Edward III, was entertained here in 1359 after a jousting competition. And in 1520, Queen Catherine of Aragon, King Henry VIII's first wife, is entertained here. Shard Lake's fictional stay at the Maid's Head has been commemorated with an unofficial blue plaque. Bishop Bridge is a pivotal location in the book and in the history of Ket's Rebellion. It's the site of the Blue Boar where Jack Barack stays, Nicholas Overton is attacked in the privy and the locksmith is found drowned here. The pub you can see in the distance is the Red Lion which occupies the place where the fictional Blue Boar would have been. The bridge dates from about 1340, replacing an earlier stone and timber structure. Bishop Bridge originally, originally had a fortified gatehouse, which formed part of the walled city's defences. The gate was one of the earliest demolished in 1791, when it was found to be damaging the structure of the bridge. But here's a reconstruction of what it would have looked like today if the gatehouse had survived. Norwich Castle Keep was built in 1120 on top of an earlier earth defensive mound. As you can see from this reconstruction, the castle fee extended well beyond the mound that we know today. From the 14th to the 19th century, it was used as the county jail. In 1894, it was converted into a museum by the architect Edward Boardman. The exterior now looks suspiciously well preserved because it was actually replaced or refaced in the 1830s largely following the original design, but not entirely, which is a bit odd. Shard Lake visits his client, John Boleyn, who is held in Norwich Castle pending trial. Unless you could pay for private, a private apartment, conditions in jail were pretty foul. Fictional character Simon, or Sooty Scambler, and his aunt lived in one of the yards in Burr Street. The courts and yards of Norwich were basically slum dwellings, built behind more prestigious medieval merchants' houses in order to cram as many working people into Norwich as possible. Josephine Brown, one of Jard Lake's servants before she moved to Norwich, lived in another slum in King Street where her husband Edward and their, with their husband Edward and their baby daughter Mousie. Their dwelling would have looked something like this. The yards lasted until after World War I when there was a big program of slum clearance. You can still see evidence of yards in the opening through some of Norwich's oldest houses. These yards have now mostly gone or been gentrified. Shard Lakes travelled around Norwich, took him regularly down Elm Hill, one of the most consistently Tudor streets in England. The street was devastated by a major fire in 1507, and most of the houses were rebuilt. The Britain's Arms, early 15th century and, and late with later additions, is reputed to be the only building on Elm Hill that survived the fire. So how did Shard Lake get caught up in Kent's Rebellion? His downfall was visiting Wyndham to find evidence about his client, John Boleyn. He and Jack Barack stay at the Green Dragon Inn in Wyndham, one of the oldest pubs in England, which has been serving ales since around 1371. Kett's Rebellion began in July 1549 in Wyndham as a protest against the enclosure of common land. 
Kett was about 57 years old and was one of the wealthier farmers in Wyndham. He had enclosed his land, but was persuaded by the justice of local protesters and offered to lead them. Their aim was to petition the king and the law protector to restore their rights over common land. The rebels arrived at St Stephen's Gate on the 12th of July, but are refused admission and had to go the long way round to Drayton Wood, Bar Drayton Wood, Mouthhold Heath, where they set up camp. As you can see, this provided a great vantage point overlooking Norwich. In Tudor times, Mouthhold Heath was continuously open countryside from Norwich to the end of the Broads that was almost treeless. The local population was free to collect wood from the heath and to allow their stocks to graze. It is only recently that Mousehold Heath has become densely wooded until well into the 19th century, it was still heathland. And because of its elevated position, a site for a number of, of windmills. There were so many rebels that the camp was larger than Norwich itself. Feeding the multitude was an immense task. Across the course of the rebellion, Kett's warrants obtain over 20,000 sheep and 3,000 cattle, with deer taken from parks. Supporters from North Elmham also sent bread, beer, fish and onions. Kett set up his headquarters in St Michael's Chapel. The chapel, along with St Leonard's Priory on the other side of Gas Hill, was built by Herbert Bishop Herbert de Lothinger in, in 1103 to replace a church on tombland that was demolished to make way for the cathedral. Here you can see the chapel in a map of around 1600, so very close to the date when Kett would have been there. Surrey Place, a house built by the Earl of Surrey on the site of St Leonard's Priory, had lain empty since the Earl's execution in 1547 and was used to house Kett's gentlemen prisoners. Here is all that remains of the temple today, just one lone wall. It's interesting that the 1600 map does show a little diagram of St Michael's Chapel, whether that's an actual representation or just a generic picture of a little church, we don't really know. St Leonard's Priory occupied a substantial site between what is now Gas Hill and St Leonard's Road. Here is all that remains today, part of the solid perimeter wall on St. Leonard's Road. On the 14th of July, Kett established his council at the Oak of Reforma Reformation to administer the camp, issuing warrants to obtain provisions and arms and arrest and try members of the gentry. Here it's seen in an 18th century illustration. Shardlake had been held prisoner by Kett all this time and was now asked to give his legal advice on these informal trials. The oak is believed to have been near the top of what is now the Rosary Cemetery by the modern water tower on Telegraph Lane East. Not a very evocative site currently, um, but uh, that's where we think the Oak of Reformation was. During the week of the 15th of July, a truce was established between the, Re between the rebel camp and the city below. Robert Kett and his followers set out 29 requests and sent this list to Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, then Lord Protector of England. The demands generally were, all bondmen should be free, stop the enclosure of land, it should be free to fish or travel by river, and fishermen should be able to keep the profits from selling large fish, such as whales, stop the lords charging extortionate rents to their freeholders, so people working on the land could earn a reasonable living, weights and measures should be consistent throughout the land, Priests unable to carry out their duties should be sacked and parishioners or local lords able to choose another. All parsons or vicars should ensure that the poor men's children are taught to read and write. And uh, the demands actually still exist in the British Library. I was rather amazed. I hadn't thought of sort of Googling where are the demands, but there they are and actually signed by Robert Kett and amongst others. Uh, I sort of assumed that when the Duke of Somerset received the demand, he'd sort of curse and tear them up and throw them in the fire. But I think the Tudors were very good at actually archiving all their documents. And it's wonderful that these demands still exist. On the 21st of July, the King's Herald visited the rebel camp 
to offer pardons to the rebels if they would go home quietly, but their requests for justice are rejected. This was not the response they were hoping for, and the next day thousands of rebels charged down from Mousehold Heath and began swimming the Wensum between the Cow Tower and Bishopgate and captured the city. And I mentioned earlier that the, uh, along the east side of the, of the city, the defences were actually the river, but obviously if you could wade or swim, the river wasn't very defensive, as Kett's rebels found out. On the 23rd of July, the rebels overran the city, arresting leaders, including the mayor, Thomas Codd, former mayors and several aldermen. Augustine Stewart was three times mayor of Norwich between 1540 and 1556, and was acting mayor while the rebels held Norwich, and Mayor Codd was confined. His distinctive house, the very leaning one, um, half-timbered one, is in Tombland. The Marquis of Northampton's army entered Norwich on the 31st of July to deal with the rebel, rebels, but hundreds of the rebels in the, under the cover of darkness with their knowledge of the maze of small streets and alleys around Tombland launched hit and round attacks on the royal troops. However, they were eventually ousted and retired to Mousehold Heath. On the 1st of August 1549, Kett's rebels regrouped and stormed Bishop Bridge again. Like all entrances into Norwich, the bridge was protected with a gatehouse, thereby creating a pinch point. So most of Kett's followers made the crossing by wading the river. The rebel, rebels confronted the Earl of Northampton's army in Holm Street, as Bishop's Gate was then called, which was too narrow for effective fighting. In order to avoid being trapped in Holm Street, they broke down the walls of the great hospital and went on to beat Northampton's army on St Martin's Plain, which now is a very pleasant area, so there's not much evidence of a pitched battle there now. However, Kett's Rebellion really fires people's interest. A recent artic article, uh, a recent archaeological dig on Tombland turned up about a dozen skeletons. Ten of the skeletons date back to Anglo-Saxon times and were found in the burial yard of the city church of St. Michael, which was demolished to make way for the cathedral. St. Michael's Chapel on what is now Ketz Heights was built in its place. However, archeologists were surprised to find two skeletons of a later date, which were likely to have been brothers and who were executed. Carbon dating puts those remains at between 1528 to 1795, so it is perhaps a bit fanciful to theorise that they were involved in Kett's Rebellion, but it's interesting that the media wanted to explore that option. Back to the battle, um, for one death we can be sure of. Have you ever noticed this plaque outside the law court in Bishopgate? It marked where the young Lord Sheffield, only 27 years old, fell from his horse into a ditch. Expecting to be captured and ransomed, as was the custom, he removed his helmet, only to be attacked by a rebel, a rebel who was reputedly a butcher named Fulk, who obviously hadn't read the, um, uh, the code uh, for uh, capturing nobles and uh, ransoming, ransoming them. He was allegedly taken to the Adam and Eve pub, but died of his wounds. And the Adam and Eve pub is a very interesting structure. It's Norwich's oldest pub, being at least 750 years old. A Saxon well still exists below the lower bar floor. Records, records of the pub begin in 1249, when it was a brew house run by monks and used by workmen building the cathedral. It was obviously time for the big guns to be brought in. The Earl of Warwick arrived outside Norwich with a stronger army of around 14,000 men, including mercenaries from Wales, Germany and Spain, and he set up his headquarters in the Maid's Hotel. However, with an ill wind, the Earl of Warwick's baggage train, including weapons, was captured by the rebels, which means that they were well armed when it came to the conclusive confrontation. On the 27th of August, Kett's rebels met the King's army in the Battle of Dussendale. Warwick's army was reinforced by 1,400 German mercenaries who were known for their colourful outfits. Although I hardly think that they'd be looking quite so dressy during a battle, but they were famous for those, uh, those very decorative doublets and hats. It's generally assumed that the rebels were poorly armed 
but in fact the rebel weapon stock included old but serviceable swords and armor, old pikes and halberds, and Kett's blacksmiths had time to produce more pikes and at least 50% of the rebels had longbows. In their raids on the city, the rebels had acquired more arms and gunpowder. They also captured artillery and were estimated to have had 35 cannon, cannons of varying caliber. The battle lasted from early morning until four o'clock in the afternoon. The location was probably not the area now called Dussindale. Leo Jarry argues very convincingly in his book on Kett's Rebellion that the site was probably Magdalen Hill off Magdalen Road next to Mousehold Heath. The battle was very closely fought, but the rebels were defeated and it is estimated that 3,000 were killed. In the fictional tale, Shard Lake and his companions managed to escape during the Battle of Dussindale and make their way back to Norwich and safety. After the Battle of Dussindale on the 27th of August, Robert and William Kett were captured and held in the Guildhall prior to being taken to London for trial. The Guildhall was built in 1407 to 24 and is the largest and most elaborate medieval city hall ever built outside London. From 1512 until 1597, Norwich's common jail was in the undercroft of the Guildhall. A Thanksgiving service was held in St. Peter Mancroft Church following the defeat of Kett's rebels, and an annual commemoration of the victory continued until 1667. In September, the Kett brothers were tried for treason in London. The outcome of the trial was a foregone conclusion. Both were found guilty and transported back to Norfolk to be executed. On the 7th of December, Robert Kett was hanged in chains from the walls of Norwich Castle. His corpse was left hanging long after his death to act as a warning to people of Norwich of the fate that awaited traitors. William Kett was similarly hung at Wyndham Priory. However, their fame lives on and their attempt to achieve social justice for the downtrodden is rightly recognized. There is no statue to Robert Kett in Norwich, but he is celebrated in a plaque on the bronze doors of City Hall, dated 13, 1938, which inspired the cover of C.J. Sansom's book. James Arthur Woodford designed the six main bronze doors, incorporating 18 roundels, featuring the history and industry of Norwich. A commemorative plaque was installed at Norwich Castle in 1549 by the front door. You can follow Shardley's journey yourselves with this self-guided trail available on either the Friends of Kett's Heights or the Norwich Society websites. So what happened to Kett's headquarters? St Michael's Chapel eventually became a ruin and was much admired by landscape painters in the 18th and 19th centuries when ruins were considered romantic and atmospheric. Here's John Phil Cotman's distant view of St. Michael's Chapel, and a rather more elaborate one. And an interesting view by Obadiah Short, which suggests that there was actually more of a building still in the 19th century than we perhaps were led to believe. And in 1830, the site was bought by the new gas company. Kett's Heights was landscaped as a market garden and promenading space for the gas workers. There are a whole sequence of interlocking, interconnecting paths and steps um, that make it a very pleasant place to wander around. A heated greenhouse was built onto the ruined walls of St. Michael's Chapel. Here you see the sort of inner wall of the chapel and the greenhouse would have looked something like that, uh, a fairly substantial lean-to greenhouse, which was heated uh, to grow um, grapes and uh, more tender fruit uh, with presumably free gas from the gas company. In the 1970s, ownership passed to the city council and Kett's Heights became a nature reserve and very overgrown, but very lovely. But in 2015, the Friends of Kett's Heights was set up to look after the site and raise awareness of its fascinating history. Here you can see a transformation of the um, 
inside of the chapel into a herb garden, which is a sort of nod to some of the activities of the monks who would have worked here um, in Tudor times. And also have guided tours. And we also held uh, a, a number of outdoor performances. In 2016, the Common Lot Theatre Group performed 1549, the story of Ketz Rebellion on Ketz Heights. So in that way, the story becomes come full circle. Ketz Heights provides a very natural auditorium uh, for these sorts of performances, and uh, it was a very successful event. So that concludes my talk about Chard Lake's journey to Ketz Heights, but I'd like to tell you something about the Norwich Society itself. What did it actually do? Uh, be best summed up as helping people to enjoy the history and character of Norwich and shape its future. And we do that by monitoring planning applications, encouraging good new design in buildings, keeping an eye on streets and other open spaces, protecting heritage buildings, looking to the long-term future of the city and encouraging people to explore the city. So do keep in touch with us. We have an excellent website. We're on Twitter and Facebook and a lot of our talks are available on YouTube. So thank you very much for listening. Um, Heights remains an, an iconic place and I hope you will visit. Um, you can book a free guided tour by contacting your friends through their website. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. Um, I think the, the one thing that you've um, uh, given me through this talk is um, uh, a knowledge that when I walk through Norwich again, I shall just not walk by these buildings without thinking about them. I mean, how many times I walked through Tombland and, um, and not really uh, looked at the buildings there and thought of their history. It's, um, it's amazing. Um, I've got one or two questions. Um, Heather asks if there is any evidence that Ket's oak has a connection with Ket. Well, um, Ket's oak is referred to um, in all the sort of uh, versions of the, the history of Ket's Heights. Um, uh, as I say, actually where it was is, uh, is debatable. And, I, and Leo Jarry has argued very convincingly that that was, uh, that was where it was. Um, just off Terragraph Lane West. There's another oak where um, people also gather to sort of discuss the rebels' demands and so on at Wyndham. Uh, and there is a, uh, another image of that, uh, but done in the 19th century. So I think there was a Ketz oak, um, exactly where it was. It, there isn't an oak of that age <laughs> still existing, um, so one can't point to one. But uh, it, it certainly is a historical fact that they, that Ketz uh, informal trials of gentlemen were held um, under Ketz, Ketz Oak, wherever that was. <laughs> Jonathan asks, is there any idea as to Ketz's motivation in leading the rebels? It's always intrigued me that he went from enclosing the land and being a target of the rebels to leading them and giving his life in the process. Absolutely. I mean, it is extraordinary. And I know there is, I don't think there's any historical evidence as to why he changed his mind. As you say, he was in a, you know, superior position. He was a, a wealthy yeoman. Um, he had enclosed his land. But perhaps, um, perhaps he was, you know, he had a social conscience and he was touched by the appeals of the, of, of his neighbours who were basically um, put out on the streets almost. Um, they no longer had the ability to use common land and they were in that way impoverished. So perhaps, you know, his social conscience did, um, you know, came into play. But it is a very interesting conversion. And also, uh, I know there's a sort of history of, of the of Ketz Rebellion, the um, drawing up of the demands and uh, sending them to the king and so on. There, certainly it does seem that there wasn't going to be a good outcome. I mean, anybody with any sort of intelligence would have known there wouldn't have been a good outcome, but they seem to have all along placed immense faith in the king doing the right thing. I mean, the king was only a child, but they, they really felt because their cause was just, the king would see that. And they were expecting to enter into no negotiations rather than have a battle. 
Um, so, yes, I mean, it, it is an extraordinary story. I think, you know, it's a bit like um, Spartacus, <laughs> in a sense, that you come across these amazing people from history who, for whom there was no good way out, but who stuck by their principles and, and faced up against um, superior forces because the cause they, they really believed in was true. Um, and I think there should be much more recognition of Kett's Rebellion because what they were asking for, their very modern demands actually, consistent weights and measures so people wouldn't be cheated. Um, people should actually benefit from the fruits of their labors. Um, children, well, boys anyway, should be educated. The clergy shouldn't be corrupt. Um, these are very modern, very modern requests actually, and, and perfectly fair. Thank you. Uh, Robin asks, is there an idea of what a best case scenario for Ketch Rebellion would have been? What realistically was the best outcome they may have achieved? Well, I think, as I just mentioned, that the best outcome would have been that the Duke of Somerset would have sent representatives to negotiate with, with the rebels. Um, but as it was, um, they sent a sort of shirty herald conveying the message that, you know, we're not going to accede to your demands, um, but you will get a pardon if you all go home quietly. Um, so, I mean, what, what Kett um, and his followers were expecting was that their show of force would show, you know, how, well, how strong they were and how committed they were, and the King and the Duke of Somerset would enter into neg negotiations with them. Um, they were hopeful that enclosure could be stopped. And, and you know, that was what they were, they were expecting negotiations to be had over enclosures and, and their other demands. Um, but what they were met with was just, you know, immense force and superior numbers and mercenaries, which I mean, is horrible. Mm. Well, carrying on that horrible uh, theme, uh, Murdo asks, uh, during the Battle of Dussendale, Sh Shardlock was chained in front of the rebels cannon. Is there any evidence that the gentlemen prisoners were treated in this way? Yes, I think there is. I think they were they were used as sort of human shields um, in, in some way to sort of deflect um, uh, attention from the rebels. Um, but you know there isn't there isn't much um, archival evidence of that. But I, I think generally, I, I think yes, they they were used in that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a similar question uh, from Sarah says that the way Sanson describes the Battle of Dussendale, it must have been the most terrible bloodbath. Mm. Has the archaeological evidence been found as, the, as buildings have been constructed in that area? No, I don't think there has been, actually. There's very little archaeological evidence and there's, there's nothing being found on Ketz Heights around Ketz Chapel either, uh, which is interesting. Um, and I, I think one of the one of the outcomes of, of, of the cats camping on Mousehold Heath, which isn't exactly archaeological evidence, is that um, because there were so many of them, and I, I mentioned the fact that Mousehold Heath was virtually treeless, they chopped down any trees there were, and actually then denuded lion wood next door. So one of one of the the pieces of evidence about um, the occupation of Mousehold Heath is in fact um, the complete sort of um, removal of, of the majority of trees from that area. So the woodland there is not as old as, you know, some other woodland in Britain. But archaeological evidence, I think we really haven't got any. And I think that's why everyone was so excited by this archaeological evidence in Tombland. Mm. Although evidence for Kett's Rebellion, I think, is very, very thin. <laughs> no, you know, sort of Charlie and others have asked that same question about you know, what, what archaeological evidence mm. has been found. So. So very little, you say. Very little, yes, if anything. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but written evidence. <laughs> written evidence, absolutely. There's very clear written evidence. And um, yes, and as I say, record keeping in, in medieval and Tudor times was absolutely excellent. So there certainly is you know, clear evidence of what actually happened day by day. Um, Delia asked, what extent did the religious insecurity of the age mean the rebels had to be made an example of? Oh, that's an interesting one. Yes. I mean, it was a very turbulent time, wasn't it? Because some um, of the Reformation had just happened. Um, 
Yes. I think probably that is, that's a very good thought. I think, I think also any sort of insurrection like that had to be put down, you know, with as much force as possible because the social order had to be maintained. And I suppose the, the religious thought at the time with the idea that people could start reading the Bible in English and start making up their own minds about their religious feelings did suggest a level of independence amongst common people that the gentlemen and nobles would have been keen to sort of slap down. So yes, I mean, that probably was, a, was a, an element in it. Um, very, very, very good thought quest uh, and question. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary asks, where was Surrey Palace? That was in um, St. Uh, St. Leonard's Priory. Um, the priory uh, during the dissolution had been given to the Duke of Norfolk and his son built a very smart palace there, uh, which was used to house the gentlemen pr prisoners. And it was still there in um, 1578 when Queen Elizabeth I visited Norwich um, as part of her royal progress. And she came up to Surrey Palace or place and had dinner there. So we know it was still a palace and pretty smart at that point, um, but it's subsequently been completely demolished. Mm -hmm. And we have one, a number of people have written to, to say thank you for the talk and how impressive you have been uh, with it. Um, but, and one person points out that um, uh, CJ Sampson is in fact ill, uh, very ill, and that this might Tomb Land might have been his last book. That is probably true, yes. Mm. I, um, he, um, when he came to launch Tomb Land, um, when was it, 2018, um, we had a fantastic event in Norwich Cathedral, um, which was absolutely packed with his fans, um, um, but he, he didn't, he wasn't well at that time. Um, mm. But, um, you know, we, we all send good wishes to him. Um, and uh, and hope that he does continue for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you, thank you, Vanessa, for that uh, for the talk. Which uh, which on the basis of the comments I've had in the Q and A, it was um, people enjoyed very much. And as I say, it will help us all while we're walking through Norwich to be more aware of the the number of very old and very and two buildings which are, which are still there. Uh, and then just a reminder again, just backing up what Vanessa said at the end, if you're not a member of the, of the society, please do consider joining us or if you fancy just making a donation, you will find a button you can press on the, on the website, thenorwichsociety.org.uk. So um, uh, thank you to everybody. Hope to see you again next month.